A lifeless, nameless body of a newborn baby boy found abandoned and mangled on a remote, snowy country road. I don't know how anybody could do that. Just, it's awful. Spurring a fight to find his identity, his parents, and his killer. You do not have to give your name. Call and help us identify this infant. A search that would span decades and a community that would never forget, calling the baby Giaga's child. And, and this may be a long process. We uh, will follow this to its conclusion. 26 years later, a big break thanks to new DNA technology and good old fashioned police work. What we ended up building was over 1,400 person family tree and we had never done it before eventually leading them to a woman who had moved on with her life, gotten married and raised three kids, always looking over her shoulder for when this day would finally come. Listen, the Otter County Sheriff's Office. You have any idea what we want to talk to you about? It was about a baby. Yeah, what about? A baby that was left. I'm taking you inside the case file of Giaga's child. I'm Sarah Goldenberg. You're listening to Dark Side of the Land. About 30 miles east of Cleveland in Geauga County, you'll find countryside you can easily get lost in. A place where fiery fall leaves give way to the winter. Here in the snow belt, not far from Lake Erie, the snow often piles up several feet high. It's a good place to bury secrets deep in the woods. But on a cold, snowy March morning in Thompson Township in 1993, one of those secrets was uncovered. Two newspaper delivery drivers made a shocking discovery on a secluded country road, a crime so shocking it would forever change this community. A baby boy lying dead in the road, missing an arm and a leg so unrecognizable some people drove by not even knowing this was a child wish we could have found it alive but cheryl jenkins knew something wasn't right she was 21 years old delivering papers with her friend wendy on sidley road when they spotted what they thought was a baby lying in the road i seen blood and, and i told cheryl i said wait a minute that doesn't look like a doll baby so we backed up and we got out of the car and it was a little baby i don't know how anybody could do that it's awful. They called police, never imagining the massive investigation that was about to begin. Just hope they find out who did it. I hope they're punished. Because there are a lot of people out there that want babies. They could have gave it up for adoption or something. Deputies and police officers swarmed the scene, and the quiet gravel country road became the middle of an urgent investigation. Investigators put up police tape, snapped photos, and searched through the woods. They carefully placed a white blanket over the baby's tiny body. Deputies found a plastic bag with blood on it down the road by some pine trees. The Geauga County Sheriff's Office activated their major crimes unit. The Sheriff's Office received information uh, with regard to a dead body. They held a press conference that March day, later making headlines across the state. To this time, we have determined that the infant was a male. We have determined that the infant was Caucasian, that the infant was less than six months old, and that it had been in the elements at least 12 hours. And the body had suffered severe trauma missing limbs. Sheriff George Red Simmons stood at a podium at the front of the room, an American flag and state of Ohio flag hung on the wall behind him. Geauga County Prosecutor David Joyce joined him. Uh, obviously, this baby has a, a mother, this baby has a father, this baby has grandparents, this baby has a next door neighbor, and certainly this baby has a name. And anyone with any information we ask that they please come forward and notify the Sheriff's Department, Sheriff Simmons, as soon as possible. Their urgent plea for help led to a tip line, and they started handing out flyers in the area. You do not have to give your name. Call and help us identify this infant. The investigation was a massive undertaking. Babies are very hard to identify, and we need 
information to find out who this baby is. Local reporters like 19 News' Jack Marshall quickly got that information out to the public. Chief Deputy James Lengel says it's possible the boy had been run over by a car or mauled by an animal. In his 20 years in law enforcement, Lengel says he has never seen anything like this. This is uh, very tragic, very disgusting. Who could have hurt and abandoned a newborn baby? Deputies interviewed neighbors in the area going door to door. They contacted police agencies across the state looking for any cases of missing infants and reached out to hospitals requesting a list of all of the births in the last three months in three counties, Geauga, Lake, and Ashtabula. And, and this may be a long process. We uh, will follow this to its conclusion. Calls immediately started pouring in to the tip line. We got a hold of hours of calls in the case file. At least two of them were from school bus drivers. They were eager to help. They saw the baby on their bus routes that morning. It was hard to determine if it was a, a stuffed baby doll or like a little stuffed animal, but I, it looked more like a baby doll from the torso, so I really couldn't make it out. So I went down in it and I looked and, wait a minute, that baby, that's a baby. And I thought, nah, that has to be a baby doll. So I decided, well, I'll check on my way back through because I have to turn around and come right straight back through. A mountainous amount of information to sift through. What was legitimate and what could lead detectives astray? Some tips like this they eventually tossed aside. But the lady is walking down the road toward Montville going east and carrying just a little baby wrapped in a blanket. Uh, Wednesday night, there was a green, a dark green Camaro, and it must have went by... 15 times. Yeah, Georgia, Atlanta. That's what I was calling about, too. It was just too coincidental that they had just said, you know, it's been 16 days since. Days passed without many answers, and the community held a funeral for the baby boy, calling him Giaga's child. Investigators used this time to do some surveillance of who was coming to the funeral. Hey, today's date is November 13th, 1993. The time is approximately 12. 10 hours. This is Deputy McGrath with Karen Walsh of the Bainbridge Police Department. Uh, we are in the parking lot of St. Mary's Church in Chardon on North Street. We are conducting surveillance of all vehicles and or people coming into the services for baby uh, John Doe that was found on Sidley Street in Thompson back in the spring of 1993. Police sat with a camcorder inside an unmarked car. They zoomed in on the license plate of each car as they pulled up, and then the driver's face before they parked. With the help of an officer several feet away, right in front of them, leading the cars through the parking lot. Adam Paul Lincoln. Dozens of cars filed in. Victor John King. That's a Giaga. Investigators were looking for a woman who would be able to hide a pregnancy. Guy in the white van, he's hugging his uh, female companion. She's overweight. Who's overweight? No, not green too bad. White, white striped shirt, a blue jacket. He got back in the van. She's going into the church alone. He's staying in the van. She looked like an elderly lady. Mm -hmm. People came to pay their respects from across Northeast Ohio and even out of state. Out of state, play Illinois. Mm -hmm. Illinois plate, William X-Ray Victor, mm -hmm. a young girl. Mm -hmm. That operation brought no answers, but they didn't give up there. Investigators also set up surveillance cameras in a few locations, including a camera aimed at some neighbors' houses across from the crime scene. But there's not much movement on the 50-minute tape. A year later. Detectives continued interviewing possible suspects as tips rolled in. They thought maybe a teenager could be the mother of Giaga's child. When you saw him in June of 1992, you were how old? In this cassette recording of an interview, they spoke with a teen who had miscarried a baby and was connected to the area. They got her medical records and eventually crossed her off the list. At one point, investigators even brought the case to a psychic. To love and care for this little child, we now entrust him to the eternal embrace of God. 
Meanwhile, the community, so touched by the tragedy, raised money for a headstone, which they placed in Maple Grove Cemetery, not far from where the baby was found. On the back of the headstone, a poem reads, Giaka's child lies here, now in safety, loved by many, just too late. The headstone still stands in the cemetery today. Decades later, people still stop by to pay their respects, leaving children's toys and flowers. Rubber duckies, a fire truck, and a pumpkin sat in front of the headstone when we visited in the fall. Back in 1993, deputies set up a surveillance camera there too, wondering if the parents or suspect may come by to visit. By then, it was winter again. The tapes show footage through snowstorms and clear days from November to Christmas Eve that year. Sometimes the headstone sat all alone with no visitors. Other times it was busy. Some visitors brought their children or flowers to pay their respects. On what should have been the baby's first Christmas Eve, the headstone sat in silence in the snow. Years passed and investigators kept digging, but still no answers. And Giaga's child remained unidentified. A decade after the baby was found, they got their hopes up again. In 2003, detectives tried to crack the case using new DNA technology. But after checking DNA collected from the baby against a law enforcement database, nothing turned up. 32 pages of documents from the Geauga County Sheriff's Office show investigators never stopped looking for answers, even when it seemed like the case was more than cold. It turns out they had several female suspects the public never heard about in the 2010s. Investigators gathered their DNA and ruled them out when they didn't match Geauga's child. And the years continued to pass by. In 2018, a break in an infamous cold case across the country gave them hope again. Suspected Golden State killer, 72-year-old James D'Angelo, appeared in court Friday. He's suspected of committing at least 12 murders, more than 50 rapes, and staging hundreds of break-ins going back to the 1970s. Investigators used a new method called investigative genetic genealogy to track down the Golden State Killer, harnessing information in genealogy databases with DNA and family trees, narrowing down the list of suspects until they found the right guy. And that inspired a new detective on the case in Geauga County to give it a try. I found that it was possible for us to do that in this case uh, because the Cuyahoga County Medical Examiner's Office had kept tooth buds, DNA from those tooth buds from the baby and that that DNA was suitable for comparison. Detective Don Seaman set out to track down what happened to the baby in a new way. The hits that would come up initially were very distant, like third to fourth generation cousins. Most people, third generation cousins, they don't even know that they exist, they're so distant. With two massive family trees under construction, Detective Seaman begins a new exhaustive search with dozens of leads and dead ends. He's looking for a needle in the haystack, comparing the baby's DNA to ancestry databases, looking for matches. DNA evidence has been helping detectives solve crimes as far back as the late 1980s and early 90s. But now it's a whole new frontier for law enforcement and forensic scientists. They're using DNA in a different way with investigative genetic genealogy. Actually, I was the first one to try it in 2011. I am the pioneer. I spoke with Colleen Fitzpatrick, president and founder of Identifinders International, to learn more about how it works. She did not work on the Giaga's child case. We find people. We do genetic genealogy and we identify people. Fitzpatrick solved two John and Jane Doe cases before investigators finally caught the Golden State Killer. And that case brought this new investigative technique into the spotlight. It all starts with a DNA sample. We get DNA from the crime lab, the law enforcement agency. We send it to the lab. The lab creates, uh, you know, a data set or, or a, a profile uploaded to the database and we look for matches. And then we do our Sudoku puzzle. What has it been like to have this new ability to help solve cold cases in this manner? You know, there's nothing like it. I mean, uh, you know, I wish I could clone myself and do so many cases and help so many people. 
Um, when you're, you know, in a room and the family finally has been brought closure and they come and they all hug you at one time and you see them crying and they're so happy. Now, countless investigations like this are underway across the country. They use public genealogy databases to look for a match. In the future, I think it's going to continue. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. This is too effective a way of solving crimes. Inspired by how investigators solved the Golden State Killer, Detective Seaman set out to give genetic genealogy a shot. That same year, 2018, when he took the lead on Giaga's child. Again, the case was never closed, and that was uh, through the due diligence of the investigators throughout the years that never gave up. This was never a closed case. It wasn't closed, but it was definitely cold. The investigation needed a new approach. I spoke with Detective Seaman at the cemetery about his work on finding the identity of Giaga's child. So tell us a little bit about the first time you saw this headstone, first time you came out here when you were working on the case. Uh, we come out here often. Um, I live close by, so uh, even to this day, I probably come out once a week. Uh, throughout the investigation, I was out here often. Not many law enforcement agencies had tried investigative genetic genealogy when he decided to try it out. So I started working with the companies in the labs to see what we needed to do. I approached my administration from the sheriff's office and the uh, county prosecutor's office with the possibility of doing it and the initial cost of doing it. And to their credit, I believe I had a check in my hand that day for $5,000 to start this uh, new investigative tool, if you will. Evidence preserved 26 years ago by the Cuyahoga County Medical Examiner's Office would be key. They extracted DNA from the baby's tooth buds back in 1993. And teeth, experts say, are the best source of DNA. And that that DNA was suitable for comparison. Uh, that is very remarkable because in other cold cases that we have that we're still working on, the DNA is old technology, it's not suitable or it's diluted or multiple samples. Genealogy sites collect saliva for DNA, but they didn't have that. So the, the DNA from the tooth bud had to be sent to a private lab to be turned into that kit and then it was submitted to the genealogy companies. That was in August. After getting their hopes up, another disappointment for detectives a month later. The results weren't what they were hoping for. The lab they worked with didn't find enough close family members to move forward. So a little disappointed at this point. What do you decide to do next? Uh, actually very disappointed, because uh, again, I had just uh, uh, convinced them to spend $5,000 and uh, I was sick to my stomach when I saw that, worried that I was going to lose my job. Uh, so uh, the other investigators and I decided to, to push forward and um, try to move forward on our own. And, um, you know, building this, what we ended up building was over 1400 person family tree. Uh, and we had never done it before. Uh, we had no experience and we kind of learned as we went on how to do that. And uh, uh, again, we didn't get that. Some cases they give you, here's your suspect, go get them. We didn't have that, so we had to do this all on our own. That public site they used to submit Giaga's child's DNA sample was GEDmatch, the same site police used in the Golden State Killer case. The hits that came back were third to fourth generation cousins of the baby. Over the next few months, Detective Seaman painstakingly built a family tree for Giaga's child. So this is a massive undertaking. Tell me where you even start. Uh, so I started looking at some of the um, public uh, genealogy sites like Ancestry, 23andMe. However, we could not submit the baby's DNA kit to those private sites. Uh, they won't let law enforcement uh, submit uh, cases like this to those private sites uh, because of confidentiality. There is another site that we were able to submit the, the baby's DNA to. And what we later learned um, at the end of the investigation that there were a lot of close family members that were, um, that had submitted kits, but they were still in those private sites. And you can choose to share your DNA with the public site. Um, <clears throat> so as we went through, we learned that a lot of those kits were already there. We just had to contact them, know who they were, and uh, most of them were very willing to transfer their DNA kit, even if it was just briefly for us to see the, the correlation or how close of a family member they were, um, they were very willing to do that so we could see what the results were. 
but it was amazing how many people helped us and were very willing to, to allow us to see the, those comparisons. Do you think it was because of the nature of the subject? You know, when you tell them about this, this baby boy, nobody knows his name for decades, and, and that kind of, you know, really tugged at people's heartstrings? I think it did. Um, and we learned, too, we wouldn't just cold call people because of, unfortunately, you know, everybody would be very apprehensive whether or not we were legit. So even if they're in other states, um, around the world, we would have local law enforcement contact them first and let them know that we were, you know, legit, we were law enforcement, we were working an active case. Um, and we would explain to them and, sh and show them news articles from years past uh, that you know we were just trying to find the circumstances surrounding this baby's death. Uh, at that time, we didn't know um, something could have happened to mom, and maybe she was dumped in a different location, and we never found her. Uh, it was very lucky that we did find Jaga's child because he was dumped in the woods. And unfortunately, if it weren't for animals that drug him into the roadway, we may have never found him either. So, um, you know, knowing that. You know, we were trying to, to resolve this case and maybe there were other, other victims out there. Uh, I think uh, the folks were very, very willing to cooperate with us. Eventually, Detective Seaman tracked down the man who submitted that close DNA match on Jed Match. We did identify a family member very early on who without him, we would not be here today. Finding him put them on the right track. I'm Sarah Goldenberg. You're listening to Dark Side of the Land. His name was Vernon Holden, and he lived in Omaha, Nebraska. Detective Seaman called him one February day in 2019. Hello? Hello, is this Mr. Holden? Yes. Mr. Holden, my name is Don Seaman. I'm a detective with the Geauga County Sheriff's Office. How are you, sir? He filled him in on the case and his work on Ancestry websites. So, and again, I get in way above my head. I, you know, poked around on Ancestry. I saw your, you know, your family tree on there and, you know, what was, mm -hmm. what was public and what was private. And off of that, I was able to develop a family tree. It turns out Vernon had submitted his father-in-law's DNA to the site, and he was a third-generation cousin match to Giaga's child. So I have developed a family tree. I have over 500 people in it now, and I'm still not done. I'm probably about three quarters of the way done. I would say 90% of those people are not from Ohio or don't have any relations to Ohio. Most of them are from the state of West Virginia, specifically Doddridge, uh, West Virginia. Not only did Vernon have a connection to Northeast Ohio, but he had developed a large family tree on Ancestry. We're all trying okay. to do everything we can. So uh, with your help, hopefully we can get closer to some closure for this. If I can help, I'll try to help. All right, I really appreciate it. And that's when the investigation started speeding up. And that was our basically our ground zero uh, to build that family tree. Vern had submitted that kit, but it wasn't his family, so he hadn't done a lot of work on that portion of the family tree, if that makes sense, because it wasn't his family. But he did assist us, and he was instrumental in teaching us how to build this family tree and helping us along the way. Again, without him, we wouldn't be here today. They started talking to people who showed up on that family tree with a connection to Giaga's child. Some lived close by, others lived across the country, even around the world. We built that family tree and then we started contacting folks and they would tell us, well, you know, Sue is related to me and in the family tree too and she's in Ancestry. So we would reach out to Sue and say, you know, explain to Sue the nature and then ask her to put her DNA from the private sites into GEDmatch so we could see the correlation. GEDmatch compiles the DNA and Ancestry information from other sites, but only if it's uploaded voluntarily. Most people were more than happy to help. And that was able to, uh, very instrumental in um, taking that ocean, if you will, that family tree of 1,400 people down to a pond. So the DNA lies the groundwork, but you still have to go out there and do the regular good old fashioned police work. It gives you leads, um, much like if somebody called in and gave us information, but you still have to go out to talk to people. You have to interview them. You have to get information. You have to uh, substantiate that information, make sure it is accurate. Detective Seaman had a clue from the baby's DNA profile that could help narrow things down. 
The child's father was of Middle Eastern descent. He was Lebanese. As winter began to thaw in April, the family tree of Giaga's child continued to grow. Uh, but when you're working a case this big, this is all consuming. I can't tell you uh, how much work we put into it. Uh, again, we were talking to people all over the world, uh, France, Lebanon, England, the different time zones. I would come in in the middle of the night. I would use Google Translate to communicate with these people. Um, I would get an email and get so excited because we found like a piece of the family tree or something and I would come in in the middle of the night and work on it. Um, a lot of the people that were working night shift thought I was crazy, but um, we knew that we were heading down the right road and hoping that eventually we would be able to bring some resolution to this case. But before that would happen, detectives hit a number of dead ends. Over and over, they kept striking out. There were several times throughout the investigation we thought we had it. Uh, figured out. Um, I remember getting excited, all of us, you know, hooting and howling in the office uh, on many occasions uh, that we thought we had it figured out just to find out that it was just another um, at that end, if you will, that it wasn't, you know, where we were trying to get to. They interviewed new possible suspects and potential parents of the baby. Most people on the family tree lived in West Virginia. And when we finally started finding people that were here locally in Northeast Ohio, we started reaching out to them, making contact, you know, doing police work, interviewing them. And um, we had talked to uh, a family here locally. And the next day I got a call from an attorney and he said, I represent a gentleman and you were talking to his cousins yesterday and he got a girl pregnant in high school and she told him she had a miscarriage and he thinks he's the father. And uh, we're again excited, ecstatic, because we thought we had finally, you know, uh, found the resolution we were looking for. Uh, we met with him and his attorney, got his DNA and found that he was not even closely related to Chuck's child. I mean, he was, but not as close as what we needed to be. One clue even led detectives back down Sidley Road where Giaga's child was found. A distant family member of the baby remembered visiting her uncle who used to live there and his pregnant girlfriend. She was a medical doctor and she gave us a very vivid account of what she described as a crazy uncle who lived on the very street where Jaga's child was located. And she said she graduated in 93. And she remembered being at this crazy uncle's house in November of 92 for Thanksgiving dinner. And that this uncle had a girlfriend that he really didn't let out of the house. That girlfriend, she said, never had the baby. And she never heard about it again. She thought the girlfriend may have had a miscarriage or given the baby up for adoption. Detectives learned her uncle still lived nearby. We got some trash pulls. We got some DNA out of the trash. And um, again, she's very closely related. She has this uncle that lives on the street. He had a girlfriend that was pregnant at the time, no baby, and he was not the father. So um, again, another, another uh, time that we thought we had it figured out and we just didn't. But the DNA hits were getting closer and closer. Back in Omaha, Vernon narrowed down even more family members, and detectives kept pushing forward, speaking to closer relatives of the baby, asking personal questions about marriages, affairs, and divorces. And you guys were married till like 95? If you mind me asking, what, what led to the divorce? They asked about pregnancies, miscarriages, and estranged family members. They questioned another male relative here. And somebody like yourself may not even have known that you got somebody pregnant. You know, uh, mom could be out there. There's so many possibilities at this point. And I'm not saying that it's, it's necessarily you, uh -huh. you know, but it, it could be. But he wasn't the baby's father. Investigators eventually figured out Giaga's child was a grandchild of one of 10 siblings. They started getting DNA from descendants of those siblings and did not have a match so far to the baby. So they went to visit the only living possible grandparent. Uh, his name was Harvey. Harvey was adopted outside of his family at a very young age. I think it was three to six months old. We didn't think we would ever identify Harvey. And his adopted last name, Eastwood. That's because his adoption records are sealed. It was a big get. We elected one day, kind of on a spur of the moment, to go talk to Harvey. Again, we talked to Harvey for about 45 minutes, 
said he wasn't familiar with the area. He only had two daughters. They recorded their trip to see him. Hello, are you Harvey? Yes, I am. Harvey, my name is Don Seaman. I'm a detective with G Geauga County Sheriff's Office. Detective Seaman tells him they need to talk to him about an investigation. It's mostly to do with your family and your ancestors, your family tree, that kind of stuff. They talk for a while about his family and the work they're doing with genetic genealogy. They tell him they'd like to take a sample of his DNA. But it is very amazing, you know, what they're able to do through the DNA, so. I guess I'm not that interested or really care that much one way or the other. I mean, it's just, I've been too far removed from the family. From the family. Right. So, so and, and that's why in that regard, it would help us, you know, bring some resolution to this. As they spoke, they learned Harvey didn't even seem to know where Geauga County was. And as we were leaving, he made a comment about uh, one of his daughters, or that his kids and grandkids met their spouses at a camp. And that was kind of that moment where we turned around and said, Harvey, what camp? What are you talking about? You never told us about a camp. And he started giving us directions on how to get, get to that camp, which was leading right into Geauga County, Ashtabula County. Um, he gave us the name of the camp, and my partner and I Googled it, and because we weren't familiar with it, it was Camp Canonia just a mile away from where the baby was found dead in the road. Detectives then asked Harvey again whether either of his daughters dated a man of Middle Eastern descent. He said, well, yeah, my daughter Gail, she married a guy, I think he's Lebanese. And that was when we knew that we had found what we were looking for. Um, ultimately, Harvey and his wife gave us DNA that day and it came back two weeks later that they were the grandparents of Giada's child. A huge break in the case. The mother and father of Giaga's child identified. Their investigative work just had to be confirmed by DNA once again. Now that they had the name of Gail's husband, Mark Ritchie, investigators went back to the other side of the family tree and found the Ritchie last name linked to Giaga's child. There it was, 1,400 ancestors later, an enormous family tree finally connected the suspected father and mother to Giaga's child. Gail was, you know, this common you know, person, no criminal history, no, not even a traffic citation. She had never even come up throughout the investigation. From there, a flurry of search warrants were issued, leading to this moment deputies from Geauga County Sheriff's Office had been waiting for for 26 years. Gail Eastwood Ritchie's borrowed time was up. This is Geauga County Sheriff's Office. Uh, we just want to see if we could talk to you for a couple of minutes. In May 2019, two detectives approached Gail in her driveway in Euclid, a suburb of Cleveland, recording on their body cameras. Gail stood next to her car, wearing glasses, jeans, and a red fleece. Her purse slung over her shoulder like she's ready to leave, but she doesn't look surprised to see them. You have any idea what we want to talk to you about? Because I kind of think you might. It was about a baby. Yeah, what about? A baby that was left. Mm -hmm. Next in episode two, the confrontation and confession, a mother's horrifying secret uncovered more than two decades later. Did her husband have anything to do with it? And is this the only crime Gail had covered up? I'm Sarah Goldenberg. Thanks for listening to Dark Side of the Land.